The year is 1997. It's August at the recently opened Tokyo International Exhibition Center. It is the largest international convention venue in the entire country. Featuring a tower and two wings, each with space for different events, restaurants, and large spaces designed for easy movement in large groups. Inside, over 400,000 people will enter the venue for Comic Cut. It's a not-for-profit event dedicated to doujin or self-published works, which runs twice yearly, even to this day, and is considered to be the largest fan convention on the entire planet. It's the 52nd edition of the convention. And among those 400,000 in attendance, among the cosplayers, entertainers, authors, artists, and all the others that come together in order to celebrate the surreal exhibition, enters an extremely thin 19-year-old man, Junya Oda, or as he's more frequently known by, Zun, the short-form nickname that came as a result of arcades only having room for three letters on high score screens. He's a vendor, coming into this event for the first time in order to sell a study project of his. A small game he had finished in 1995, and had been showing off at his university during 1996. It's called Toho Raiden, highly responsive to prayer. Toho coming from the Japanese word Toho or Eastern, referencing a world based in Eastern mythologies at its core. It's an Arkanoid clone at heart, featuring a purple-haired girl named Reimu, a shrine maiden, and her quest to punish the ones responsible for destroying the Haruke shrine, which she is tasked with protecting, going so far as to enter hell to get her revenge. Along with this game is a sequel, a more recent project of Zin's, Toho Fumaruku, the story of Eastern Wonderland, a vertical top-down shooter game featuring Reimu attempting to stop an invasion of Haruke Shrine from an onslaught of ghosts and yokai, facing off against characters much similar in scope and abilities to the heroine, and a series of stages in battle reminiscent of the games Zun enjoyed in arcades. These games were designed for a type of computer called the PC-9800 or the PC-98, a line of Japanese 16- and 32-bit computers from a company called NEC. They were very popular machines for their time, however, were beginning to struggle to keep up with the changing times as the 90s were carrying on especially with the advent of the Windows 95 operating system a few years before our story begins. These computers were starting to fizzle out by 1997, and while they would hang on until 2003 with minor revisions and upgrades, to play games you would want to be running DOS on these machines, which it goes without saying was more and more antiquated, outdated, and simply obsolete. Windows was extremely unstable on a lot of PC-98 machines as well, which caused a lot of titles to run improperly on the aging hardware, with support getting worse and worse as time went on. By the end of the PC-98's life, the systems were being sold with Microsoft Windows 2000, an operating system built off Microsoft's NT kernel, which doesn't use DOS in any way, which limited backwards compatibility with software that was built with DOS in mind. You cannot use almost any actual PC-98 software on these systems as they were on release. Not that any of this mattered to Zun at the time, however. In his own words, I just didn't see it as a platform for game development. The only way Zun could release his games was to go to Comic Cat. He was a small one-man team just working at his computer, fresh out of university, and the fledgling internet of 1997 was far from where it is today with platforms like Steam or GOG. He had to sell his games the old-fashioned way, in person, and Selly did. That weekend, Zun would sell 30 copies of the first Toho game, and 50 of the second, something he didn't believe was possible. The year is 2022. It's May at the Tokyo International Exhibition Center, inside which fans would soon get to enter for Raisaitai, the largest yearly convention dedicated solely to Toho in Japan, and a convention that has reportedly seen over 40,000 people historically. Made for showing off both new official Toho merchandise from different companies, alongside unofficial Toho fan works. During the event, pre-orders for new plush toys for the series go live. Crashing Ami Ami's website, which was not prepared for the influx of users rushing to it. Zun's Twitter account shows over 470,000 followers. In the world of mobile gaming, the title Toho Lost Word has surpassed over 2 million downloads globally. It is one of many Toho mobile games. Around the world, Zun is celebrated for his characters, his music, and his creation. Toho has grown to be just as popular as many AAA series. All of that from 80 floppy disks on that August weekend of 1997. Here's where I come in. You see, I'd always heard about Toho. I'd seen memes, heard some songs. I knew I knew about Toho, but I never really understood Toho. Why do people love this dumb, cute girl simulator? Why are people so absolutely crazy for this? How badly am I going to butcher half the names in this video leading to a massive backlash in the comments? How did this series go from such a small thing that came up sometimes on image boards or when people gave hush whispers of legendary difficulty 
culture, reaching things like people calling for the main character to be in Super Smash Brothers, huge tournaments for the series, subcultures forming from this community of people from all sorts of walks of life, skill levels and interests. I know some friends who have played the games before, but I'd never really heard of anyone in my regular friend circle really sing its praises. So I did the reasonable thing. I looked up guides, I looked up information on where to start with the series, and I immediately absolutely ignored all of that. Started with highly responsive to prayer, suffered immensely, seriously, don't start here, that's yes. a really bad idea, don't do what I did. And now I have four Fumos, with another pre-order on the way, I have a problem. I regularly play a Toho fighting game, have a few mainline games under my belt, and shortly before finishing writing the script, spent about an hour reading a Toho manga when I was supposed to be working on it. And one of my most played games on Steam is a touching emotional support tool where Sakuya dabs. Look, what I'm trying to get at is... Toho really sucked me in. It's a series that in the last year or so, along with eight months of working on this very video, has come to be this thing that has grown to mean a whole lot to me. I love the characters, the world, I love seeing new things involving it, learning the stories and how fans interpret these characters, and how that impacts the world Zun himself created. It's also fascinating to me, but I'm getting way ahead of myself. Like what even is a Toho anyway? For those of you who aren't aware and uh, weren't paying attention a few minutes back, what the hell, dude, not cool. Toho is a series of independent anime-style top-down shooter games from Japan, developed by Zun entirely, for better in some cases, or worse in others. And if you want the most simple answer to that question, you can stop right here. You can leave the video right now. Just, just don't do that. Because like our boy Shrek here, there's a lot of layers when you start digging into it. In most Toho games, you play as one of a handful of characters depending on entry, with the goal generally being stopping some sort of threat to Gensokyo. Gensokyo being a place resembling feudal Japan, which has a large barrier surrounding it, separating it from the world in the 1880s thanks to this crazy yokai lady. It is a place where anything that becomes fantasy, things that have fallen out of favor in terms of beliefs in the outside world, or rather our world, goes to. This includes lost items, meaning there's probably an entire portion of Gensokyo dedicated to whatever the hell happened to my sock drawer. No, I'm, I'm not talking about the socks, the, dra the drawer's gone. I don't know what happened, and I'm almost scared to find out. It's a world of mystery, of different cultures from our own world, interpretations of folklore and stories in a form, be that partial or whole, that fits Gensokyo. As our world evolves, Gensokyo evolves alongside it, our own history becoming part of what makes this interesting and mysterious, yet somehow familiar space. As time passes for us, so too does it in Gensokyo. Of course Reimu these days has a cell phone and the characters know about the internet. Of course, characters who have resided in Gensokyo for a long time would be intrigued and confused by a rocket ship landing on the moon. Of course, there's a giant nuclear plant in the mountains far away from the rest of civilization. For all the magic and insanity within Gensokyo, there's something almost mundane about it, too. It can create an almost sense of nostalgia, even for someone who's never really played the series because of how immediately familiar this world is. At its core, Gensokyo is built around our world, its history built off our own history. It is a world whose lore continues evolving as, well, reality continues to evolve. Toho has a lot of bases in Shinto religion, Japan's indigenous religion. Shinto is a polytheistic religion centered around kami, who are said to imbue themselves in everything all around us, ranging from people to animals to the food we eat in the places we go. People who practice Shinto religion might have shrines in their homes or go to shrines to give offerings to the kami in exchange for their blessings. In Shinto, there is no good or evil, rather instead there's purity. All people are pure and can become pure, just as they can become impure through various actions. It's a religion that in more modern times has adapted parts of Japan's second most popular religion, Buddhism, into it, taking on that religion's views of the afterlife, while putting emphasis more so on what we do here in this life and the impact those things have. To bring this back around to Toho, because I am super unqualified to be talking about religion, Shinto exists all through the world against Sokyo. Reimu is a shrine maiden of the Haruke Shrine, one of the handful of religious sites in Toho's world. Though we don't know which god this shrine is for, other than it's pretty peeved that no one really worships it. Some kami who have fallen out in our own world end up forced to Gensokyo. Some of Reimu's signature abilities stem from her connection to Shinto in the Haruke Shrine, with the Ying Yang balls being a blessing she has received. The other two shrines represent Buddhism and Taoism, but we'll get to those a while later. I think it's really interesting that this series is able to pull from so many different aspects and areas of Japanese culture, which like I mentioned earlier helps create a familiar yet different world in Gensokyo. There's a lot of people of all different shapes and sizes in Gensokyo, all pulled from our own world's cultures and beliefs and modified to fit into this world. From regular humans to yokai to vampires, half yokai, gods, oni, rabbit people from the moon, bird people, dumb people, even crazy people. 
The residents are mostly all females, however there are a couple guys too that they tend not to be super relevant. They all have different dreams, aspirations, goals, and lives to live. Toho puts all these different cultures and concepts together into one breathing world and asks the question of how these different characters' beliefs and ideals mesh and conflict with each other in an ever-evolving space. It's a lot to get into, but f at least for now, the big thing to remember is that almost all of the cast are ridiculously powerful, and that in Gensokyo, being right means being able to win in a battle in the face of conflict in the eyes of nearly every single one of them. So powerful, in fact, that it's mostly universally agreed upon that even the most nefarious of characters use special cards to both limit and signal their attacks in order to make things fair and stop unwarranted death and destruction. Creating a balanced fight between characters with incredibly otherworldly abilities and some rando just trying to get a glass of milk, with more than a few members of the regular cast actually being strong enough to just end reality if they so choose in some horrifying way, it's a way to kind of balance things out, both from a gameplay perspective as well as lore-wise. Everyone in Gensokyo agrees that if your goals and resolves are truly strong, then they will be enough to power you through even in the toughest of battles. So a handicap shouldn't really matter in the end, and just ensures that anyone can make their goals a reality should they try hard enough and hold their own in a battle of bullets. Thanks, Raymond, for writing the rules, unless you didn't. Now, with all that said, you might be asking yourself, well, gee there, Inners, who's the most powerful Toho, then? The answer's Chirno. And no, I will not be explaining myself. For the most part, mainline Toho games stick to a top-down shooter style, and they are mighty difficult. Look, there's a reason you're gonna be seeing a lot of B-roll here, and it's not just because I'm on a death march to get this video done at some point this year. I'm not very good, and my footage... <sighs> It isn't much better. Within the games, generally speaking, your objective is to take down a series of enemies per level using a combination of your own attacks, which you'll use to build score as well as get access to collectibles, which will help power you up, as well as a handful of bombs that the game gives you that will generally give you some kind of benefit, along with stuff like clearing the screen or the area around you so you can, you know, dodge all this shit. One hit and you're dead. You have limited lives and continues very game to game with some having infinite, some having few to none, and there's one of them where if you continue twice it becomes impossible to finish the game. Super cool. At the end of each level, you face off against a different boss in order to help bring you closer to stopping whatever crisis is occurring in the world and deal with whatever nefarious little bugger is messing with things. In most cases, facing off with a mid-boss as well. Facing off against your enemies in a battle of bullets. To master Toho, you must become good at not just dodging bullets and remembering patterns, but grazing those bullets as much as possible to where you're just narrowly passing them to help raise your score faster, which will give you more lies, while you also have to focus on hitting your enemies. Some bosses in particular require pixel-perfect movements, knowledge of patterns off by heart, and even still there's a chance you might just get blown out by shit like this. Even on lower difficulties, it can be a real challenge to clear some of these levels. This tough-as-nails gameplay can be really frustrating at first, especially if you're generally unfamiliar with top-down shooters, but don't worry, the Stockholm Syndrome's gonna sink in soon enough. There are variations on this gameplay loop, and there may be an unlockable stage at the end, but this is basically the objective of Toho when you boil it right down. I'm going to repeat, yes, there's a lot of variation on which entry in the series you're playing, but for basic, if you're just a common Joe who hasn't heard of a Toho before, this is what the series is about. At the start of most games, you get a handful of characters to choose from, almost always featuring Reimu, who I previously mentioned, and Marissa Kurisame, a sticky-fingered magician with a habit of getting into trouble due to her curiosity. Occasionally, it's just one character. Occasionally, you'll see more than two. Sometimes Marissa isn't around as a playable character. Sometimes you'll play as two characters at the same time. Each of these characters has their own pros and cons and their own abilities and their own bombs. When starting a Toho game for the first time, it's good practice to experiment a bit with different characters to see what you like most and go from there. And barring that, just pick whatever Marissa has Master Spark and start blasting. Works every time. Toho games like many shmups really test your reflexes and your ability to think on your feet quite heavily. If you're new to this genre, it's going to have a steep learning curve and you're gonna die. You're gonna die a lot. Look, there's nothing wrong with going with a lower difficulty if you need to with these games, and don't let anyone tell you otherwise. Completing a Toho game is an accomplishment no matter how you cut it, and it can be highly addictive and fulfilling to complete levels, bosses, and entire games with a gameplay loop that encourages you to keep trying to break through and just get that little bit farther each and every time. And after that, keep trying until you can pass these games without needing to continue and get the game's true ending in a lot of cases. There's no shame in dying or losing. As long as you keep trying and never give up. It's a gauntlet, it's a trial by fire, but it is something that, with practice, anyone can accomplish. With time, effort, and just a little suffering, you'll have that first 1cc under your belt. And we'll be asking what a 1cc is, but don't worry, this video is like two hours long. Of course I'm going to explain that. I'm going to explain that right now. That's why you beat the game without, without a continue. It's, it's called a 1cc because, you know... 
it's one credit clear and you, it's called that because because arcade routes and arcade games they use credits and you know it's one credit so you one credit one credit so you beat a game with one continue you don't need to use more money so it's a one one credit one credit clear and that's why it's called a one cc <laughs> Wow, Grin, I hear some poor soul crying under the night. I don't like top-down shooters. I can't be a two-who. My life is suffering. I wish for the sweet embrace of death. And to you, I say, dude, get out of my backyard. It's like 4 a.m. Christ. But if you aren't into top-down shooters for whatever reason and the fighting games aren't your thing, I haven't talked about them yet, but I'm going to get there, here's where the fan works come in. A major portion of Toho's success can be attributed to Zune's position on copyright for the series in that there really isn't any for the most part. Just like... Don't be a dick and make sure to credit Zun. If you're going to be a dick, get Zun's permission to do so. Seriously, like, if you're making a Toho game or movie or hood ornament, you're pretty much free to do so, just as long as you're making it and not reusing Zun's own work to do so. In more recent years, this has changed a little bit, and you have to get Zun's permission to put a game up for sale now, and browser and mobile games have to be free to play, but otherwise, he is extremely relaxed with the copyright regarding the series. As a result, Toho has a thriving fan game scene. Some free, some not, but regardless of your budget or interest, there is something for any and everyone. It's pretty special. Want to play a Toho racing game? Pick a flavor! Toho Metroidvania? There's one so popular it sold 250,000 copies on Steam. How about a visual novel where Sakuya dabs? I already told you about that. But did I tell you that there's DLC where another Toho character Natori eats a cucumber? Or how about fishing? There's visual novels, first-person shooters, mods for popular games, strategy games, 3D platformers. Probably like a million RPG Maker games, if that's your cup of tea. If there's a genre, there's probably some Toho game for you out there. Don't like video games? Play Toho Lost Word. Don't like video games and have no money? Because you spent it all? On Toho Lost Word? Well, go look at fan art or any number of fan-made manga or anime adaptations of the series. As an aside, my god, some of the stuff looks better than the things that actually make it out officially to air from major studios. It's really pretty. The stuff these artists and animators cook up is freaking awesome. Don't have eyes to look at the fan art? Listen to the fan music, of which there's a wealth of, ranging across all areas of the franchise and any genre you could ever wish for. Or just listen to Zen stuff, because it's awesome. Watching this video for the Toho fan of your life with no eyes and no ears? I don't know, get one of the Switch games from the eat or something. I'm not a magic man, what do you want from me? If you were to go on to any major art hosting site, you will find tens of thousands of pieces of Toho fan art. You can buy fan art books, you can buy books to learn how to draw featuring Toho characters. There are thousands of pieces of fan fiction out there, doujin manga good and doujin manga bad. Look, to make my case, I can go right now and I can buy a bucket hat with Dreamer's dumb face on it. And it's totally above board to do so. Take that, Mario! All this fan support and content is attributed to a lot of success for the series overall, especially over here in North America, where to this day it's incredibly difficult to get some of the Toho games officially. Official PC 98 re-release never, ever. It's nice that even if we don't get all the games Japan has access to, there's still piles of stuff that almost anyone can get their hands on. Fans have put together so much incredible content surrounding the series that it's truly something anyone can get into and enjoy in their own wacky way. And of course, as a result of this, with all the fan support and ease of access in one way or another to the world against Sokyo, Toho is going to attract people from all walks of life, for better or for worse. But there had to be something to get the ball rolling. How exactly did the series get so big in the first place? Now, Toho is split into two eras, PC-98 and Windows eras. PC-98 games take out the first five entries in the series, highly responsible to Prayer, Story of Eastern Wonderland, Phantasmagoria of Dim Dream, Lotus Land Story, and Mystic Square. And while pretty solid and still hold up well, except arguably highly responsible to Prayer and Story of Eastern Wonderland, a lot of people would recommend doubling back to these older entries after trying out some of the Windows-era games. And... Even at that, it's not really the end of the world if you skip these entirely. These days, going with newer entries is not only easier and more accessible, but the Windows Air games just have way more quality of life improvements over the old school PC-98 games. Besides, the Windows Air games were a clean reboot for the series and also axed a lot of the old characters, replacing them and re-establishing the world anyway, which for longtime fans is a huge bummer, sure, but it makes it a bit easier of a pill to swallow in skipping these older games when trying to get the hang of everything. I'm sorry all you mysterious orb giga chads. Maybe one day, Zune will bring your waifu back. This era of Toho can be described as a bit strange. Toho Highly Responsive Prayer is an Arkanoid type game where you have to whack a yin yang ball around and vertical movement hasn't been invented yet. A vertically challenged Reimu here is sort of a glorified paddle with the ability to run along the floor, do a sick power slide, shoot bullets coming at her, and swing a broom to knock a ball around, which can also kill you if it hits her. It's... well, it's something alright. I've heard mixed feelings from fans on this one, and it's very much like a black sheep in the series nowadays, even amongst the PC-98 games 
Its story has almost no bearing at all with anything that comes after it, but it's still a very interesting experience. And it did introduce a fan favorite character in Mima, who would become a mainstay in the PC-98 era and now lives on in countless fans' hearts. And only those fans' hearts, who desperately, desperately wish that Zune would bring her back already. The second Toho game, Toho Fumaku Story of Eastern Wonderland, introduced Marissa, natural redhead, who knew? And this sure is the first shoot 'em up Toho game, alright? Look at that top down shooting action. A lot of stuff that even later PC-98 games got is just missing here, and it can be incredibly jarring to a player who's only familiar with new entries. There's no grazing bullets here. There's no death bombs, no fancy gimmicks or tricks. This is just Reimu with three shot types. Her flying turtle, bullets, and some bombs, and that's pretty much it. Something unique in Story of Eastern Wonderland, however, among the PC-98 era games is how music is handled. With the game having both FM audio and MIDI versions of the soundtrack, with the MIDI version being a far higher quality, but requiring an external sound device, as the PC-98 wasn't capable of MIDI audio out of the box. Toei Majiku Phantasmagoria Dim Dream, the third Toho game, released December 29th of 1997, and has a pretty decent cult following amongst the other PC-98 games. Having grounds put together more like facing off in a puzzle game than a shmup, you go up one-on-one -on -one against either an AI or a player-controlled opponent with the goal being to blow up as much stuff as possible, with each thing you destroy causing an explosion, and the things getting caught in that explosion getting tossed over to the opponent to deal with. Games start pretty slow, but as both sides increase their special meters, it quickly becomes total chaos. It creates a really unique competitive experience, and apparently this game's super fun in multiplayer. Somewhat unique amongst the PC-98 games is that even with the newer contemporary, this game is still regarded by fans as one of the most unique and interesting games in the series. With some going so far as to say that if you're going to play one of the PC-98 Toho games, this is it. Toho and Sokyo, Lotus Land Story, this game has a place in the name, came out August 14th, 1998, and is an evolution of Story of Eastern Wonderland and introduces Marissa as a playable character. There's also a ton of quality of life improvements here. Grazing has arrived, bosses have health bars now, and a focus mode was added where you can perform more precise movements. There's not a whole lot else to really note here except Ellie is probably that floor tile guy's dream come true, and that Yuka Kazumi would end up being one of the few characters to make it back in the PC era. Oh, and there's one other elephant sized apple in the room, but we'll we'll get there, don't don't you worry. The final PC 98 Toho game, Toho Kakidan Mystic Square, released December 30th, 1998 and it is the most refined of the PC-98 games. Being the closest in terms of gameplay to the Windows era entries in the series, and it introduced Alice Murgatroyd, another one of the handful of PC-98 characters not named Ramu or Marissa to survive the Greek culling. Mystic Square is extremely similar to Lotus Land Story in nearly every way, except now there's Cheetos! It's a bit more lenient than Lotus Land Story, and almost a celebration of the games that had come out before it. This was designed to be the ultimate Toho game, and it shows. It's an incredible final form of what the previous games had built towards, showcasing all of the fan favorite characters at this point. It's almost unthinkable now, but I can imagine a world where a small budding fan base had this as the last title of the series, and that it would never achieve its full potential. Creating a cult following still being remembered today, but probably not really outside Japan. Luckily we don't live in that world, I personally think we're far better for the series having continued, but it's very clear that this was designed to be, at the time, a send-off that pays respect to the history of the series. It creates an incredibly unique time capsule with the power of hindsight and makes this game very interesting. That said, now with the PC-98 out of the way, we enter the Windows era. In the game in this series, a lot of people, including myself, will say is the best to really start with if you're interested in playing the games in this series. Toho Kamakyo, Embodiment of Scarlet Devil. It can be a lot more forgiving than older titles and has arguably the largest cultural impact as a whole meaning it has a ton of support and information for a beginner looking to dip their feet in the series. It's really good stuff, and like, in my opinion, the best example of what Toho is at its core without adding any crazy gimmicks. Just, uh, if you're using a modern computer, maybe make sure to grab the fan patches and make it run at a slightly more reasonable frame rate than 4000 FPS, or you find out what fighting God feels like. Toho in its early years began to gain a cult following online in Japan. However, Embodiment of Scarlet Devil brought the series into the limelight to way more people, ditching the soon-to-be-discontinued PC-98 computers that were the original home of the series in favor of more common Windows computers. Funny enough, Zuna stated in the past that he didn't intend to continue the series past the PC-98 at the time, originally intending to let Toho die with the outdated hardware. However, instead decided in the end to continue with the series anyway. Don't you think it's kind of funny that the first Toho game on Windows features a mansion, not known for having many? In Bottom of Scarlet Devil released Comic Cat 62 on August 11, 2002, and as mentioned, it acted as a clean break from the series' PC-98 history. Raymond and Marissa returned, but not a whole lot else. 
This game would also go on to introduce many characters who would go on to become fan favorites. If you have even a passing knowledge of Toho or have heard someone mention it, you're likely aware of at least one of the denizens of the Scarlet Devil Mansion. Sakuya Izayoi, Hongmei Ling, Patchouli Knowledge, or Melee Scarlet, and Flandry Scarlet. Chino debuted here. Koakuma was a mid-boss and never really had any other appearance, but people still love her. Rumiya was there. No, Rumiya? Everyone remembers Rumiya, right? Oh, poor Rumiya. It is a testament to how well regarded the characters in this game are that even a character that didn't make it into the final game and only exists as a line of text, Rin Satsuki still managed to have fan art of her created. I, for one, am real pissed off that a fellow Rin has been slighted, and the council will be hearing of this. And it's here, as we are in the early 2000s, that we start to see the series begin to evolve into the hot mess we know today. All starting with a brand new Toho, with a brand new and broader scope being more openly available, the PC-98 in the rearview mirror and embodiment of the Scarlet Devil making a statement, Toho wasn't just going to keep going, but it was going to keep getting better and better. The game itself was a slow success at first. Zune was still mainly selling these games at Comic-Con and by mail order at the time. However, with time, it would go on to become one of the most popular games of all time in Japan, the best-selling game in the Toho series, and is widely regarded as the very best the series has to offer, even today. Having its steepest competition for that title in the form of its follow-up, 2003's Toho Yoyomu Perfect Cherry Blossom, which would add even more content as well as bring back Sakuya as a playable character, as well as introduce many more popular characters like Chen, Yomu, and Yukaku. If you're looking for an ignition point, it's right here. The series would build off the bones of EOSD, what it did right, and its reestablished world surrounding Toho, and as a result would eventually start to leave the realm of just gaming, it would start to leave a mark on pop culture as well. Zun's original goal, promoting his music through his games, started to pay off. Yuan Own was her. A song Zen made in roughly four hours in the theme of the secret boss from Embodiment of Scarlet Devil, made to embody a devilish girl in an oriental and mysterious way. It stood out amongst the game's soundtrack of already stellar music. The name an allusion to the 1939 Agatha Christie novel, and then there were none, which featured a serial killer with the initials Yuan Owen, or unknown. It's the boss theme for the character Flandre Scarlet. One of her spell cards also shares the name with the book as well, reaffirming this. This song of the entire soundtrack to this game was Zun's favorite, he himself touting it as the best song in the entire game. The song was pretty popular already, sure, but it was nothing compared to what happened when it ended up among the many that would get mad remixes throughout the early to mid 2000s and beyond. Now you might be asking what mad remixes are. The best comparison I can find to a mad remix I have in modern terms it's like an absolute primordial form of what would become a more modern YouTube pooper mashup. Or all those videos featured Anarchy God Rest His Soul. These videos would use music and mix other videos to match up with the song, generally for comedic effect, and get uploaded to early video sharing sites. And they still have a pretty heavy following to this day. To be perfectly honest, there's almost like a weird sense of nostalgia watching these for me. Can't quite put my finger on it. Calling Mad Remixes popular would be an understatement. They were a phenomenon through the 2000s, and even today, like for context of just how popular these sorts of videos were at their peak in Japan, we have to look at American gay porn star Billy Harrington. Bear with me here, I actually have a point to make. Billy Harrington became considered a hero in Japan due to his popularity from these remixes. To the point, Nico Nico straight up had him shipped over to visit Japan, with the Good Smile Company releasing not one, but three special limited edition figures to celebrate him in 2009. And to this day, people still remember everyone's favorite Anarchy. His spirit living on in the musical remixes put together from actual gay porn that people found. And this is just a single subgenre of mad remixes. Billy Harrington passed away in 2018 after a tragic accident at just 48 years old, with tributes commemorating him and his life receiving hundreds of thousands of views. Hell, in 2022, there's a petition to put a statue of the man up in the Ukraine as a replacement to a Russian statue that was being considered for demolition due to the ongoing conflict. That petition got over 25,000 signatures. Later on in life, Billy Harrington made a point out of visiting the country to regularly meet with his fans, and to this day, he is still celebrated as a man who is larger than life, and whose legacy carries on. 
All this because at some point some guy was watching some porn and thought he would make a banger out of, well, people making banners if you catch my cold. <laughs> anyway, getting to the point now with context, keeping in mind how much of a big deal these remixes are, and were at the time especially, these videos were spreading Toho's music around like wildfire. And alongside them, people uploading the original songs from the games through file sharing sites, the at the time new Nico video and YouTube, along with more traditional remixes of the games being sold at Comic Cat events, actually showing the success Zun had to this point in reaching one of his original goals in making Toho in the first place, using the platform of video games to showcase his music. Look, it probably isn't how he imagined it would go, but his music was still getting heard by people all around the world in one form or another. UN Own was her remixes would start to bleed over outside of Japan around 2008 or so. This video of Ronald McDonald has over 17 million views, oh my god! Later in the year, the channel I Am Tachibe would upload the original version of the song, and over time it would also amass a further 12.8 million views in its lifetime. And it's not like the train ever really stopped with UN Own was her spreading around either. My first real introduction to the series came from this video here, Impossible Piano Song Death Waltz UN Own was her from 2011, featuring a MIDI that would, in fact, be impossible for any human to ever play. I was enamored by how ridiculous the song was. I'd never really heard anything like it before. Toa wasn't really a thing I knew much about at this point, and I know so many others who have never played a Toho game, and likely still to this day, would never have a passing interest in playing one, that if I were to play this song, they would go, Oh yeah, that song, I remember that. For a time, Yuan Own was here almost surpassed the series itself in some ways, becoming a very popular piece of music and pop culture. You have to understand, the impossible song for a hot minute was THE thing going on. I legitimately heard radio jockeys talking about a crazy YouTube video they saw of an impossible song and how crazy it was. It's kinda surreal to think about. Meanwhile, while UN Own was sure was standing tall as a huge draw for the series, there was another unexpected song making the rounds that would reach legendary status in its own right in time. Bad Apple. Bad Apple is a song from Lotus Land Story that started gaining popularity in the community once again from Mad Remixes. However, unlike UN Own Was Her, it isn't how the song became so legendary in the Toho community and beyond. In October 2009, a Nico Nico user named Anira uploaded a preview of their video for the song using a 2007 remix featuring a Japanese pop singer Nomiko. The song would go on to become the first video to ever reach 10 million views on the platform. This video can best be described as an absolute work of art, featuring 3D models of many different cast members from throughout the series as black and white silhouettes. This video is incredibly praised for its unique style and look, with it going viral from how well loved it was. The video blew up so much that it made CNN news, and because it's a news station talking about video games, they totally whiffed it, using a stop motion recreation of the original video and stating that the original was made in stop motion. Mwah. There were other songs for sure that made an impact too, namely Embodiment of Scarlet Devil's Night of Nights, which had a burst of popularity in remixes, it was a bit of a meme for a hot minute, and Cherno's Perfect Math Class, which has fans comment on it in droves every September 9th for Chirno Day, given her association with the number 9. A joke stemming from the community noticing that in the instruction manual for Phantasmagoria Flower View, she was labeled 9 in a screenshot, with the description simply being, moron. Alongside music, Toho had gathered a following on the Japanese image board site 2Channel, a website for like-minded individuals to communicate through threads with one another anonymously. The website would generate many a fine meme, but the first to really note is, this here in the industry is what we like to call fucking up. Look, this poor Anon in an attempt to create shift underscore gis art of Raymu and Marissa saying the phrase Yukuri shitide ni, do it slowly or take it easy depending on how you translate it, accidentally really messed up their heads. And here's where the memes start to come overseas to 4chan, an American site inspired by sites like 2channel. It's a shithole. You either love that shithole or hate that shithole. I'm not here to debate about the quality of the shit, I'm just here to talk about cute anime girls. More commonly known as Yukuri's based off the original post, they would start bleeding over the 4chan's JP board, and from there they would start spreading like weird head-shaped weeds. Yukuri's on their own started getting merchandise, some of which were really creepy to look at. It spread to other characters like Hatsune Miku, among others, and as this was a fan work based off an anonymous post on a Chinese basket weaving form, you'd think that the Yukuri would be sacred. However, for a brief moment, there was a copyright troll claiming to have ownership of Yukuri's, trying to get people to pay 100,000 yen per year for the use of his phony trademark. The Zun even had to get involved, and there were even bomb threats apparently made against the copyright office for this. Oh my god! 
a road here that I truly hope you Kyries will be safe someday from copyright trolling and can live their blissful lives, just not near me. Well, luckily for me, in the time I've been writing this script, this is all past. So they can live their beautiful lives and please, please never ever get near me. Alongside this, other memes from 2chan and 4chan would start intermingling a bit. Chen Honking is still a silly little meme I have an incredible adoration for. Mostly because I will not be silenced, damn you. Other 2000s era Toho memes include Wolfas, which were characters created from a Toho Flash game, which led to a simplistic art style that we still see in use even today. Any video upload for a while featuring the character Oku would feature the word Caution, and a reference to the warning pop-ups during our spell cards. Some memes are better than others, of course. For every Yukari, there was a joke about being murdered for implying that Sakuya uses paddings to make her Sakuyas look bigger. But they can't all be winners, can they? All this time as this was going on, Zun was dividing his time pretty heavily. While Toho was becoming more and more of a success, he was still having to work for Taito, a job he got in 1998 after showing the interview Toho, after which he would be immediately hired on, working on games like Magic Penji, The Quest for Color, and Exit before departing in 2007. All the while, he was still developing Toho games, and while he didn't intend for Toho to be his life's work, amongst all the growth and swelling fan support, he was able to leave Taito in order to focus more time on the series and do what he truly wanted to do. Zune would go on to say he incredibly disliked working for Taito as a company, and in later interviews mentioned that the company had grown interest in acquiring Toho, with bosses asking him if he would like to publish the games under their label, before afterwards attempting to move him to heading multiple projects. When told he was to take on extra work or resign, he opted to resign and leave the company. By the time of his departure, Taito had been purchased by Square Enix, and to this day remains a subsidiary of the company. In an ironic twist of fate, in 2020, Taito would release a Toho game of their own, Toho Spell Bubble, a rhythm puzzle game. The company who once tried to seemingly crush the spirit of the creator of Toho, now having to obtain the rights in order to get in on the action of the series. And all of this going on as the series was still growing and evolving. The series' eighth game, Toho Yasho Imperishable Night, would release in 2004 and would feature rabbits! Fuck yeah! and would also have a team of characters which you could switch between on the fly using their own shot types, with teams being comprised of one human with an unfocused shot and a yokai with a more focused shot, with some enemies' attacks only affecting one of the pairs similar to another top-down shooter, Ikaruga. It would also introduce last spells, a stronger bomb that can be used for twice the resources of a regular one, and if you hit the bomb button within one second of your character getting shot. Zin made this game with teams in mind, but struggled filling out these teams, mainly with regards of having enough yokai to match human characters. And with this title already in mind, decided to bring back Alice from the PC-98 and Perfect Cherry Blossom in order to make her appearance seem more natural as Marissa's partner in the Windows era. Though at this point it was believed she was human, her profiling game lists her as a magician, and it would later be confirmed that she is a magician yokai. This is also the first mainline game with a downloadable demo. Yay! The main antagonist of Imperishable Night, Kaguya Horasan, is based off a 9th to 10th century Japanese folk story, The Tale of the Bamboo Cutter. A story of a man who, upon cutting a stalk of bamboo, found a thumb-sized infant inside whom he raised and grew to an adult within three months. Five nobles attempted to gain the favor of Kaguya and her adopted family. And uninterested, Kaguya gave the potential suitors five impossible tasks, agreeing only to marry a noble that can accomplish theirs. Find the stone begging bowl of the Buddha, a jeweled branch from the mythical island of Harai, a robe of Chinese fire rat skins, a colored jewel from the neck of a dragon, and a kauri shell bomb from a shallow. The men all fail for various reasons, and following this, the Emperor of Japan comes to visit the woman, and also falls in love with her. However, she reveals she's not of the country and cannot go with them, and they instead opt to maintain contact through letters. In the end, Kaguya reveals she's not of this earth, but of the moon, and was sent to earth as punishment for a crime, and that she must return home in time, and that her attachment to the material world would be her punishment. She would be forced to return home, as well as forced to forget her time on earth, but in her last moment before forgetting her earthly ties, she writes letters apologizing to her adopted family and the emperor, leaving her robe behind for her family, and a small vial containing an elixir of immortality for the Emperor, before returning to the moon, leaving them behind. An officer of the Emperor delivered the letter and elixir to him, and upon receiving it was overcome with grief. He turned to his servants and asked which mountain was closest to heaven, and one suggested a great mountain in the Saruga province, which the Emperor ordered his men to venture to the peak of in order to burn the letter 
in hopes that it would reach Kaguya, as well as the elixir for he couldn't bear to live an eternal life where he would never get to see her. The mountain in the story in modern times is known as Mount Fuji, based off the word Fushi or immortality, with kanji that translates literally to mountain abounding with warriors, derived from the army carrying out the emperor's orders. Some say that even to this day, if you look out to Mount Fuji, sometimes you can still see the smoke from the letter burning, even today. In the world of Toho, Kaguya also has five impossible trials, and it is revealed she has the five items from the trials in her possession. She was banished to Earth for creating Immortality Elixir, but decides to stay in a bamboo forest after her cohort, Elrin, betrayed the Lunarian emissaries and helped her to escape to what would later become Gensokyo. Eventually, another Lunarian race and joined them. After escaping the front line of a war she believed had started as a result of the American moon landing, Kaguya would eventually be reunited with Moku, another immortal, who holds a grudge over Kaguya leading her father to his death with her impossible trials. As they're both immortal, they continuously are in an endless battle involving repeatedly killing one another. Anyway, in this game you go to the moon and beat the shit of a bunch of rabbits. It's also worth noting that a mechanic involving darkness is used as one of the boss fights of this game. A gimmick originally intended for Rumia, an embodiment of Scarlet Devil, before it was scrapped. Oh, poor Rumia. The next mainline entry would arrive in 2005 with Toho Kazuka, Phantasmagoria Flower Review, a spiritual successor to Phantasmagoria of Dim Dream, bringing back the versus style gameplay of that game that had been inspired itself by another game, Twilight Star Sprites from the company ADAK in 1994. Zun wasn't going to make a game for 2005, but changed his mind after realizing that 2005 marked 10 years since he had originally made Highly Responsive to Prayer, and he wanted to celebrate that, believing that battling against friends with a wide cast of characters is the best form of fan service. After the game launched, Zun would start working on an online patch to face off against friends anywhere in the world. However, it wasn't very good and was soon abandoned so he could focus on other things. It's also the earliest title in the series available for purchase on Steam getting added back in 2022, and it's the only game from this part of the Windows era to have a modern release. It's actually theorized that the other Windows era games prior to this have had the source code permanently lost, meaning that there's a chance we might never see a proper re-release of these older titles on platforms such as Steam. But who really knows, miracles have happened before. They brought Yuka back, they could do anything. After this, the series would go on a two-year break, with Zune coming back in 2007 for Toho Fujinroku Mountain of Faith, created in a whole new engine, and designed to bring things back to basics, back to two characters, a soft reboot, and a breath of fresh air for the second Windows era. Instead of focusing on the world against Tokyo and its inhabitants, Mountain of Faith asks the question instead of what the impact is when new things, concepts, and people are brought into this world, the interactions it leads to, and the conflicts that might arise, with a new shrine arriving in Gensokyo along with a shrine maiden of this new shrine attempting to assert dominance over the established Haruke shrine in the name of the gods the shrine represents. It goes about as well as you expect. The game's a little simplified in comparison to the last two entries, and the level design is a lot more designed around getting to the bosses as fast as possible. You just face roll some levels by just using bombs repeatedly, and the game seems to honestly encourage that. There's also this really funny bug that leads to the game being the easiest to 1cc by far, by choosing Marissa B and keeping her power between 3 and 3.5, the game doesn't properly handle how much damage she does, leading to just melting bosses like their butter. It's pretty silly. This game would go on to have a large cultural impact, with fans of the series traveling to the Suwa Shrines, which inspired the design of the Moria Shrine within the game. Since 2008, Toho fans have taken the pilgrimage to pay respects of the shrine, leaving drawings of Toho characters and prayer plaques at the end of their journey. Some locals even actively promoted the practice to help keep fueling the local economy, which was helped from a combination of this and fans of a Japanese drama coming to the temple for similar reasons. I want to do my part, so here's a shot of my pilgrimage. To a picture of a shrine, I printed it off and taped to a lamppost. To approximate what I would do if Thunderclub had a million subscribers, and I could afford to make a trip to Japan for a two second bit. Suwaku so got introduced here too as the former god of the Moria Shrine. I only mention this because I like this frog. Next up in 2008 would see the release of Toho Cheriden Subterranean Animism, the 11th game in the series, and the most difficult by Zen Zone Mission. It is the only game where the good ending can be achieved on the easiest difficulty, and he openly said that it is not expected for most players to be able to handle the harder difficulties of this game. It would be the introduction of fan favorite characters Satori and Koishi, both being Satoris, feared among the yokai for their strong mental abilities, which include the power to read the hearts and minds of anyone around them, as well as the ability to drag out a being's most traumatic memories and cause amnesia, allowing them to recreate the trauma someone has experienced, however, always in a slightly imperfect manner. 
Koishi's the more tragic tale, as in an effort to seal away her Satori abilities, sealed away her own consciousness. As a result, she operates entirely on her subconscious alone, unable to really think and lacks a lot of awareness, almost as if she doesn't really have a mind at all. She can manipulate how she appears to others, however, with few exceptions, unless someone knows of Satori, once Koishi leaves someone's line of sight, she ceases to exist for that person. Satori and Koishi each have pets, though we only really know Satori's, one being another Rin, I see the council's influence is ever growing, and Yutosha Ryuji, a burb who ate part of Yadagurasu, after a sick dare from the Moria Shrine Goddess, leading to her gaining the power to harness nuclear energy. Okay. Now, for the most part, up until now, Toho had pretty much stuck to its roots, with mainline games all being top-down shooters in some capacity, but this would change with Toho Immaterial Missing Power coming out December 30th, 2004. It is the first official spin-off of the Toho series, introducing a trend of spin-offs using a decimal to differentiate themselves, in this case 7.5, and the first time Zun would rely on outside help for an official project, coming in the form of a doujin circle by the name of Twilight Frontier. With Twilight Frontier's general producer, Yunabara Iruka, approaching Zun with the idea of an aerial-oriented fighting game, realizing that the world of Toho would be perfect for such a title, and this would allow the team to make the game they wanted without creating an entirely new cast of characters. Immaterial Missing Power would not quite go all the way with this aerial combat idea, however, instead being a more traditional fighting game with an emphasis on projectiles and outzoning your opponent, while using the grazing mechanic from the mainline Toho games, Immaterial and Missing Power would go on to be the first time an artist other than Zun would draw the characters for an official entry as well, with that job going to Twilight Frontier's Alphas, who would go on to continue to provide art for spin-offs. This game's fallen out of popularity in recent years due to other fighting games arriving for the series, however it does still have a small, very dedicated community around it, has rollback netco, which can't be said of all the Toho fighting games, and has a rich history of major tournaments in its heyday, leading to an amazing time capsule existing of old-style YouTube combo videos, which are a huge blast from the past to look at. Though, sadly, it looks like most tournament results appear to be lost to time, with the services and websites that were used to chronicle them seemingly just being gone. This is a game that would lay the groundwork for what was to come from Toho fighting games, and despite being a little bit basic in comparison in some ways, it is still a favorite for some people who played the game at the time. This game would also introduce Oni to the series in the form of Suika Ibuki, a fun-loving drunk who attempted to draw out other Oni from hiding by causing an incident where everyone would be forced to keep having parties endlessly. Oni and Toho are a lot more fun generally than their historical counterparts, with Oni historically being seen as human-like creatures who would challenge humans and pressure them into games they could never hope to win, before taking them as their prize after being victorious. Within Toho, the Oni got tired of humans cheating at games in order to get away, so they went into hiding and eventually ended up in what would become Gensokyo, before moving to the underworld to avoid dealing with rules and order, striking a deal with Yukari to be left alone in the former hell and to not have to deal with yokai, and in exchange that helped keep the evil spirits left behind from getting out of control. Suika was considered one of the four devas of the yokai mountain who ruled over it, before moving to the underworld for a spell and then ending up staying up in Gensokyo. Suika is likely based off Shuten Doji, a mythical Oni known for his taste for drinking sake, who was killed by the hero Minamoto no Raiko via decapitation. Upon losing his head, he attempted to take a bite out of Minamoto, only to be foiled in this last attack because he prepared for such a situation by stacking multiple helmets on his head. Shuten Doji also lorded over the four heavenly kings, or four deva kings. Toho deviates a little bit in this, however, by having Suika as a member of the four instead of leading over them. Also, she doesn't really eat flesh and drink blood, she just gets really, really drunk. She would later become a mainstay in the series, mostly hanging around the Harake Shrine and drinking with Reimu, who Suika befriended due to how upfront Reimu is. We only know two other members of the four devas of Yokai Mountain. Yugi Hishiguma, a strong oni who lives in the underworld with some of the other oni where she fights and drinks to her heart's content. She's actually considered the strongest character within Toho physically, with Suika being the only one really in contention for that title, as well as Kaisen Ibaraki, who was once a malevolent oni who had the evil in her heart sealed within her right arm, and then cut off being replaced with an artificial one. She's far more serious than the other oni we've gotten to see so far, with her hiding her oni origins and masquerading as a hermit instead. In 2008, Toho would receive its second official fighting game, Toho 10.5 Hisoten Scarlet Perception Heaven, Scarlet Weather Rhapsody. With it getting a sequel and expansion in 2009, Toho 12.3 Hisoten Toku Unperceiving of Natural Law. Chase the Enigma of the Gargantuan Guignol. 
For sanity's sake, I'm just going to combine them under the most popular name this game gets, which is just Soku. They're both essentially the same game with different rosters, and honestly, the complete version of it is Soten Soku literally just has you remove files from Scarlet Weather Rhapsody. So unless there's something relevant to mention about one in particular, that's just how we're gonna do it. These games are quite different from a lot of other fighting games, incorporating parts of Toho as a series into the gameplay alongside featuring a unique weather system. They put heavy emphasis on projectiles, as well as provide a wealth of movement options to both graze opponents' projectiles to help build meter, but also to help position yourself to either maintain distance or getting close to start a combo or get in to use one of your spell cards this game's specials. Also, unlike other fighting games, you actually have direct input into what specials you have available to you as this game uses a card system. A material missing power would have a somewhat similar system, however in that game it only gives you a choice between three cards that the game will match to go with. Scarlet Weather, Rhapsody, and Soku on the other hand have you make an entire deck of cards that you bring into a match with you each of which has their own abilities and costs associated. This creates an incredible amount of depth. Do you want more cards to use in a match? You'll want low cost abilities that might not do as much damage, but might be better for comboing. Or you can go the opposite route and go for large specials that do huge damage. However, the more powerful an attack, the more cards you have to both have available and use to use that ability. So for example, this costs one card to use. This costs five. That said, you could do that one card ability far more times in a match than you'll ever be able to use this insanity. You build up your cards by grazing projectiles, doing damage and blocking attacks. You have a limited number of shields, meaning you have to actually respond to pressure eventually instead of just blocking like there's no tomorrow. Even with perfect blocking, you will run out of shield eventually, and you don't want that to happen, or boom. Some characters will also use shield to go up in the air, with some having infinite flight, some having limited flight, and others still not even having flight at all. As you build up cards, you can switch between them with one button and activate with another, and once you use up all your cards, that's it. You're done for that round with them. Every 16.5 to 33 seconds, the weather will change, starting with clear, which has the shorter 16.5 seconds active, before changing over to a weather condition that affects the game state in some way. Ranging from small things like increased damage to total insanity like Typhoon, which disables all hit stun and flinching, leading to this shit. And blue skies, which makes it so you can cancel a special into another special. What the you can utilize this to your advantage, as the weather always follows a fixed pattern, and the next upcoming weather is always displayed at the top of the screen. And on top of it, you can use some of your cards to manipulate upcoming weather to something that benefits you more than it does your opponent, or try to end a weather event early. Soku is a game that combines both resource management, space management, weather management, situational awareness, and mastering your character's tools and abilities to both function well up close, as well as at a distance in multiple different situations in any given game state, while building meter to use your most powerful special abilities. It's pretty good. The unique gameplay combined with the fact that it could run on a broken VCR led to this game starting to gain a heavy cult following despite hiccups early on. In 2008, communities like the His Tent IRC chat were born to provide an easy way for players to connect with one another and get matches in online. Early on, it was pretty slow going with a heavy defense-oriented meta game that had yet to be explored due to the game generally suffering from 4-8 to eight frame input delay online. Wikis for Soku were made in particular with the goal of educating new players on the characters and keeping the game alive, and for a short while, it was actually regular for the game to be a ghost town during this period due to players being spaced so far apart and unable to play against one another. Once again, leave it to 4chan to get evolved as threads would help bring new interest to the game. In 2011, the game would go on to have its first major tournament, Mado. Due to some ongoing drama and other issues, another IRC of Soden was born, flooding the community up some, but the year would end strong with a tournament that still runs yearly to this day through Hisoten. In 2012, Soku would become one of the earlier examples of rollback netcode being implemented for a fighting game, a trend that strangely still wasn't really that big a thing at this point in time. This would lead to a huge influx of players, new and old, entering the community and helping to build it up even stronger, with issues arising here and there impeding the game's growth. 4chan's V-Board would end up being instrumental in keeping the game alive as newer players were getting turned off by IRC being pretty dated compared to what a lot of people by that point were used to. The metagame evolving from people not really aware of what they are doing to finding areas of the game they can abuse with certain characters. The Typhoon weather condition until around 2014 generally was seen as being a gentleman's rule not to fight until it cleared up 
and it would turn into a weather condition players would push into on purpose to gain an advantage, which was the biggest example of this. Tournaments were hosted to give away a physical copy of Soku as the first prize. Regions started running Skype groups to coordinate local players and events. We also saw the birth of a Soten Soku Saturday's weekly tournament. Try saying that five times fast which as of recording has the honor of Soku Saturday 200 being one of, if not the largest Soku tournament to date. Tools will start being released to allow the game to be better analyzed with things like frame data and hitbox viewers becoming available, and through 2016 and 2017 the community would keep growing. Hisoten would end up moving over to Discord, keeping the hashtag in its name as a reminder of its history. This game immerses but a meme. More weekly events would start running with the goal of giving new and less skilled players a platform to show off their skills with the Rising Stars on November 5th, 2016, followed by other players taking up the idea on their own, first with Scrubby Fridays and then going up, followed by another person taking it over and calling it Rising Stars before finally Dream Chasers, all of which ran on Fridays. Hence, you know, the Scrubby Fridays bit. L, as of now, Dream Chasers seems to still be running even today, dubbed Neo Dream Chasers. Through all of this until now, communities have been growing and finding new and exciting ways to both play and modify this game, with lots of incredible players and modders across this game's history from all over the world. And the game itself has an incredibly healthy and constantly evolving metagame, with the game having a wide variety of viable characters. Hashtag Asodin's Discord is seemingly even more active than ever before, with new players looking to try something different from the rest of what's available on the market. Since 2017, when the server reached its 1,000th user, it swelled in size, with upwards of 3,000 users online at any given time, with weekly events and an active competitive scene. It is an incredibly dedicated community, and super welcoming too, like, if it weren't for Thineas' awesome Soku timeline, I imagine a lot of this information would just be lost, and this section would be a lot shorter than it actually is. It turned me talking about these games being a footnote into its entire own section. The server is really worth checking out if any of this interests you. This game is a blast, and I think it's quickly becoming my favorite fighting game. All that carpal tunnel is making melee wave dashing a bitch and a half. Rumia from Embodiment of Scarlet Devil was intended to be made playable for the first time in Soku, but they were forced to cut her due to time constraints. Oh, poor Rumia. Oh, I almost forgot. And this person on the hashtag of Soten Discord also started playing in September 2022. It's not apparent yet, but this is going to change everything. Anyway, back to 2000s. Soku would see another entry to the series release alongside it, Toe Sorensen Undefined Fantastic Object, the 12th mainline entry in the series, which would bring things back in line even more to classic Toho gameplay. Its main gameplay gimmick this time around being some enemies dropping UFOs. If you collect three of the same color or three of different colors, it'll summon a larger UFO for you to defeat for a huge point and power bonus. Zen went with the UFO idea both to pay homage to his own history with Taito, but also to pay respect to Space Invaders, the great granddaddy of all shoot 'em ups. And it's key to manage your UFOs during gameplay to maximize your score, something you'll want to do if you're infected with, I don't know, ransomware for example. Before I talk about that, have you seen this rat? Now you have. Undefined Fantastic Object would mark a large change for Toho, with the story moving away from its Shinto-based roots and including a lot of references to Buddhism throughout its story. Extremely fitting as Buddhism in real life Japan actually got its start in the country through interactions and similarities with the established Shinto religion through the later Heian period of the 10th through 12th centuries, with Buddhist monks being encouraged to pray for the salvation of the kami from Shinto lore, and with roots of Buddhist monks playing roles in the activities of Shinto temples as far back as the 8th century. Multiple characters are tied to Buddhism in this game in some way. Nazarin, she's meet you again, was designed by Zen as a herald of Bisham Montan, a Buddhist god and guardian of the northern direction who acts as a leader among the Yakshas who dwell in the Sobs of Sumeru. Nazarin's a mouse, as in the Chinese zodiac, the mouse symbolizes the north and carries a jeweled pagoda of Bisham Montan when she appears later in the game. The name Nazarin has roots in Islamic culture, with it meaning wild rose. Nazarin is also a pretty common name in Russian culture as well. She also shares a name with nasal insulin, but that's probably just a coincidence unless Zun thinks mouse huffing cures diabetes. Bishop Mountain is well regarded in Japanese Buddhism as a god of warriors and warfare is portrayed wielding a spear and pagoda much like the one Nazarin uses, which symbolizes the treasures he is both guardian and bestower of. His name comes from the words Bishaman, an approximation of his original Sanskrit name, as well as Ten, Heaven or God, with the nickname Tamanten or Listening to Many Teachings. In UFO, the character Shotor Maru takes the most direct inspiration from the stories of Bishamonten, namely a story in which Prince Shotoku, take notes here, he's going to come up again later, and the Soga clan were able to subdue the Mononobe clan, a well-established aristocratic group who opposed the spread of Buddhism in Japan, worried that local deities would be offended by the worship of other gods. 
This victory was attributed to the support of Bishop Monten, who appeared to provide support, with tigers coming to symbolize the god in Japanese culture as he arrived to their aid at the Hour of the Tiger on the Day of the Tiger on the Year of the Tiger. To this day, tigers can be seen in the Chogosonshi ji Temple, or more simply referred to as Shigesan. And more importantly, because what's more important than Toho's, led to show here having a motif of tigers in her design, with Toromaru translating literally to Tiger Circle. Tora can also be used to symbolize the tiger in the Chinese zodiac. She also wears what appears to be a tiger skin around her waist, which both ties back to the story, but also ties back to Vals Ravana, an Indian god who Bishop Montana is based on, who had a frequent companion who wore a tiger skin. The character Byakran Hijiri also has a lot of ties to Buddhism as well, with her younger brother Miyoran Hijiri being a real Buddhist priest who was born in Zun's hometown of Shiano province. Byakran stems from a popular story of Miyoran, where a Buddhist priestess goes looking for Miyoran, her younger brother, after he never returned, and stays where Miyoran had made his vows of priesthood originally. A Daibutsu, or a Buddha statue, tells her in a dream of a purple cloud that is over the side of a southwestern mountain and she travels there to reunite with her brother and live together with him. Biakran's name also translates to Virtuous Monk or Satan of the White Lotus. That all said, outside of its basis in history, Undefined Fantastic Object is very well known in and out of the Toho community for making its own history as well, and always in the best of ways. The first example came in 2017 where a virus known as Rensenware started infecting computers. The virus would infect a user's machine and would convert most files on their drives to AES-256 encrypted Rensenware files. It could fail in some situations, most notably if the user were to have something like a floppy drive or a CD or DVD drive installed on their computer, for example, where it's not directly rewritable like a hard drive, but for a lot of people, they'd be stuck facing this ransomware down and all of their files locked. Now, unlike other ransomware which demands money, ransomware had one ask of the infected user. Simply get 250 million points in UFO on lunatic difficulty. The virus would actively look for the UFO executable and keep track of your score in real time, and once you hit that magic number, boom, your files are back. That said, the virus didn't include a copy of the game, which meant you had to find a copy yourself to deal with this virus and attempt to retrieve your files, and trying to force the ransomware program closed would just result in your files being lost forever. Now here's the thing, you'd probably figure that some evil mastermind was behind this with malicious intent for some reason. But reality is often far sillier. It was just a meme project a Korean student named Kajian Hyo made while he was bored. He tossed it up on his GitHub and went to bed only to find out that his joke virus had, well, gone viral. He even managed to infect himself with the meme-tastic malware and then couldn't decrypt his own files because he could not reach the point requirements in order to do so. In response to everything, he made a cheat tool to force your points to go up to whatever you set it to, which will cause the malware to start decrypting on its own and uploaded it along with an apology. The story made news with Polygon reporting that the challenge is impossible for some reason, showing a video for reference, featuring someone one CCing the game as Reimu with over 250 million points. Now this wouldn't be the only situation involving UFO and malware, as both UFO and its precursor subterranean animism would run into problems following their Steam releases, with many antivirus programs falsely flagging them as malware due to Steam's encryption of the game seemingly leading to some strings in the game's files representing a virus, namely flagging the games as having the Dark Hotel virus, which was used to attempt to steal data from from traveling tourists on public Wi-Fi in regions such as South Korea. Both games would end up pulled from Steam for a time before being put back up, and some antivirus programs will still actually put up false flags on both these games even now. There were rumors that stemmed from an infected version of these games getting ripped from the site Moria Shrine and then put up for sale on Steam, with people saying it was due to Zun, losing the source code for many Toho games in the past, but those are merely rumors and not actually what happened in the slightest. Just goes to show that the growth of Toho as a whole wasn't really all positive, as anyone who's ever enjoyed a series that has had a surge in popularity can attest, it's a blessing and a curse. Older fans of the series attempted to gatekeep newer ones from the series, being dubbed the Toho Police, who felt that people coming into the fandom without in some cases owning every single game in the series, reminder, 80 copies between Toho 1 and 2, or those having not played all the original games starting from the first were fake fans or illegitimate. They were disgusted with people coming in from sites like Nico Nico upset that their precious little thing had blown up. At this time, it was nearly impossible to even meet the bar these fans were setting, as Highly Responsive to Prayer was a game that had an incredibly small print run, as I previously mentioned. Especially if they expected that on original hardware with a physical copy of the game, it, it just wasn't feasible. On top of it, while two channel had spawned memes and had an active Toho community, discussion revolving around the series would eventually become so oppressive to the rest of the video games board, it would be banned for discussion. 
leading to these memes mainly being used to mess with other users, and fans of the series being forced to relocate to other image board sites. This would also give Zen an incredibly bad taste in his mouth regarding 2Channel. Some people begin to look at some Toho fans as incredibly annoying or difficult to deal with. As with any fandom, this is just going to happen with size, but it almost felt at times like Toho would get this worse than a lot of other series due to a few factors. Some fans would give Toho a reputation for making the series seem unapproachable, or try to tie every little thing back to Toho in some way. Issues would spread of some fans being upset about how a fan work interpreted characters and looked down upon Zun for incorporating parts of those fan interpretations into his own works. At one point, Toho fans attempted to hijack 4chan's A-board for some reason. There's been brutal shipping wars between fans of the characters, people using characters to advertise crime, people doing crime guised under fan events, fan sites duking it out over which is superior. Like a lot of large fandoms, Toho's vocal minority caused a lot of issues and in a lot of ways would hinder its growth through these actions. Regardless, as we are entering the 2010s, Toho was continuing to grow in popularity, the series continuing to evolve and along with it, the memes. Some of them were even pretty good. There's one in particular I want to get into, but hang in there. Soko would end up really taking off as we were entering the decade, as I mentioned earlier, becoming a popular fighting game as side events or even featured at shows like Annie or Ozenfest. Its high speed and addictive gameplay lending itself well to being popular for people looking for something a little different than the same old. 2010 would also see two side games for the series, Toho 12.5 Double Spoiler, a sequel to Toho Bunkachu Shoot the Bullet from 2005, which features the character Aya attempting to take pictures of various characters' attacks, wielding only a camera which acts as your sole way to progress through the game, as well as get rid of bullets that are overwhelming you constantly. As well as Toho 12.8 because fuck numbers, Great Fairy Wars, featuring Chirno getting revenge after her home was destroyed, which was made as a continuation of a story from the Toho manga Toho Sengetsui, Strange and Bright Nature Deity, which Zune had been the writer for titled Fairy Wars. It featured three stages with six different routes, expanded from its original concept to feature a bit more content to make it a little bit more worthwhile in Zune's eyes, with an extra stage for completing every route. It's also notable for it to be the first shoot 'em up game to have all of its art handled by someone other than Zun, with it instead being handed off to the manga artist Makoto Horasuka to make sure the art matched up with the manga the game was acting as a follow-up to. That's right, Toho had an official manga, multiple actually. The first was Toho Sengetsui, a miniseries following the events of Three Fairies, Sunny Milk, Luna Child, and Star Sapphire, which ran 10 volumes from 2005 all the way to 2019. The first issue had art from Nimu Mitsukura, who would be forced to leave the project due to health issues after the first volume, being placed with Makoto Horasuka for the rest of its run to date. Many of the volumes had additional material released alongside them, ranging from short stories to music CDs. The manga would be broken up into four works, Eastern and Little Nature Deity, Strange and Bright Nature Deity, Oriental Sacred Place, and finally Visionary Fairies and Shrine. Of the four works, Visionary Fairies and Shrine would be the only one to not receive any supplemental material. The second official Toho manga, Toho Bogasoshu, expands upon the stories of the Lunarians, this time having the manga divided into three works. Silent Sinner Blue, which was illustrated by Aki Ida, who Zun had brought on because, in his own words, she's supposed to be really good at drawing characters really cute. Cage in Lunatic Runagate, illustrated by Tokiami, and Inaba of Moon and Inaba of Earth, illustrated by Toshira Arata, the last of which is a comedy four coma or four strip comic. Silent Center in Blue follows Remu and Marissa attempting to get a rocket onto the moon with the help of the residents of the Scarlet Double Mansion, while Cajun Lunatic Rungate follows many other characters as the events of Silent Center in Blue unfold. The last chapter features the characters all having a pool party together at the mansion and discussing their experiences. Silent Center in Blue had a CD included with it as well. These stories interconnect with Toho Sengetsui in places as well as the games, and it is a little bit of a mess to get the timeline put together. But the Toho Wiki has an awesome breakdown of the chronological order of events if you're interested, and it'll likely be needed for you to get the most out of these two manga. Alongside this, there were a few others over the years. Wild and Horned Hermit ran for 10 volumes from 2010 to 2020, was illustrated by Aya Azuma, and goes over the adventures of the character Kasane Baraki as she helps out around the Harake Shrine while she makes self-discoveries about her direction and purpose in Gensokyo. Forbidden Scrollery ran for seven volumes from 2012 to 2017 and was illustrated by Moe Harukawa, following the life of a librarian Kosuzu Motori as she deals with strange books from unknown sources releasing powerful yokai into Gensokyo, working alongside characters like Reimu and Marissa. Lotus Eaters is an ongoing manga illustrated by Izutaki involving a waitress kidnappings at a more drunk side of Gensokyo. 
And finally, there's Foul Detective Satori, an ongoing series originally illustrated by Ginmokuse for the first 11 chapters before they had the step down due to the health reasons and afterwards being picked up by Akimaki Yu, and features Satori attempting to solve more sensitive detective work where other characters wouldn't normally be able to do so, while attempting to leave her mansion as little as possible in the process. All of these manga are written by Zun and are official works set in various places in Toho's timeline, and do a lot to help expand the world as well as close the gaps the games themselves don't. They all vary in quality and popularity, but they are still worth checking out if you want some more official Toho, but don't want to be shooting bullets. There have also been a handful of regular print books as well, also written by Zun. They feature information on different characters and aspects of the world from the perspectives of different characters. Toho 13 Shin Rebut, Divine Spirit Mausoleum 10 Desires would come out in late 2011 after suffering a delay caused by the 2011 earthquakes in Japan. Proceeds from sales of the game going on to support relief efforts. It would mark another pretty big change for the series, acting as yet another soft reboot. Designed with the goal of bridging the different Windows era games into a more cohesive story and introducing some changes to the gameplay formula that the series had had to this point. Difficulty was lowered to make the game more accessible to newer players, and two new systems were introduced, the Divine Spirit system and the Trance system. Now, when enemies are defeated or a boss gets damaged, they'll drop one of four different spirits, blue, grey, purple, and green each giving a point bonus, while also filling up a trance gauge. The trance gauge when filled will allow you to go into an invulnerability state for a short time, increasing your power, and spirits collected in this state will reward you with far more points than normal. If you get hit with a full trance gauge, you'll sort of go into this last stand where the trance will immediately activate and upon finishing it, you'll die. Ten Desires also deviated from tradition in another way, taking another step away from Toho's roots and Shinto religion, and instead focusing on the teachings of Taoism, something Zen was unfamiliar with at this time and required a lot of studying to accomplish, as well as returning once again to the stories of Buddhism. Ten Desires' name and its antagonist stem from the legendary hero and politician Prince Shotoku. Hey, remember him? Credited as the father of Buddhism as a religion in Japan. I mentioned him earlier. You know how they call Japan the land of the rising sun? Yeah, all this guy. Some of his feats are a bit disputed, but wildly speaking, he is seen as someone who borders on sainthood. Ten desires stem from how Prince Jotoku was known as being able to listen to ten conversations at the same time, an ability carried on by the antagonist of Ten Desires, Toya Toyo Sam Toya Toyo Sama Miko, I'm calling her Miko, who can hear the desires of ten people at one time. Within Ten Desires, Miko, having sought further enlightenment and immortality through the teachings of Taoism, seals herself away in a mausoleum in order to sleep until such a time as Buddhism was no longer prevalent in Japan. Due to doubts over her accomplishments in life as Prince Shotoku, her and her mausoleum were warped against Okyo, her plan of using Buddhism to ease people into Taoism seemingly having failed, and her legacy left disputed. She ends up being resurrected, and her return causes divine spirits to flood into Gensokyo. And while she isn't really responsible for it, she does get her ass kicked anyway for causing such a fuss. The extra boss for 10 Desires is Mamizo Futatsuya, a tanuki likely based off one of the three legendary tanuki, Danzaboru Danuki, a trickster from Sado Island who'd alternate between tricking people and stealing from them and giving generously to those who truly needed help. Danzaboru Danuki, like Mamizu, also don't get along with Kitsune, historically speaking because Janzaburo Danuki in one story tricked a Kitsune, convincing them to transform into the Tanuki's sandals as they sailed to Sado Island, before kicking the sandals off the boat halfway there. As well as another story where Janzaburo Danuki tricked a Kitsune by saying they could transform into the Emperor's procession. They then ran away. The Kitsune, upon seeing a procession coming through, started causing them trouble only for the Kitsune to realize too late that it was all a ruse, and that they had been tricked into antagonizing the real Emperor's procession, and ended up being executed for it. Likewise to Miko, she's not really a villain either, more so a smug guide who wants to test character strengths and play some tricks. After this, in 2013, a new fighting game would hit the scene for Toho. Toho 13.5 Hopeless Masquerade, followed in 2015 by Toho 14.5 Urban Legend and Limbo, and 2017 with Toho 15.5 Anatomy of Common Flowers. These games would ditch a lot of the systems from the other Toho fighting games entirely, and instead move towards featuring solely aerial combat. And by Anatomy of Common Flowers, they would add in a master and slave name mechanic where players can pick two characters with one lending power to the other in battle. Like Soku being defined a lot by its final incarnation, Anatomy of Common Flowers seems to be the most popular of the three, however the others do still have their fans and player bases as well. It also boasts fan communities in the thousands with regular tournaments and advice for new players. 
Anatomy of Common Flowers is still getting support with a Switch and PS4 release as recently as 2021, with the game still getting active support on PC even today. It also has the benefit of being the first game spinoff or mainline to get an official English translation. It just celebrated its fifth anniversary recently. And on top of it, fans had worked on improving the pre-existing netcode for the game to make it a little bit better on the PC side of things. These games have a little bit of jank going on, and success here really is how you can embrace that, adapt to the jank, and leave your knowledge about any other game at the door in order to overwhelm your opponent. Look, I'd love to go in depth about these games like Soku, because they're actually extremely fascinating in their own right, and despite being a Soku guy, I'm really trying not to play favorites here. But this game is still pretty young in comparison, especially Anatomy of Common Flowers, and there isn't a whole lot of history to discuss when history is just starting to be made. So you, yeah you, if you think this crazy shit looks cool, go make history. Outdate this video big time. I love when that stuff happens. I can already see this happening even now with a recent cash prize tournament held on the Toho 15.5 Discord server. And I'm sure it's just the beginning. Toho 14 Double Dealing Character would release in 2013, which is notable for being the first time a Toho game was available for purchase digitally. Made available for purchase through Playism, a short-lived Japanese service similar to Steam, which primarily worked with more independent or fledging developers to give them a platform that had more support than you'd get from one of the larger players at the time. Playism would shut down its service in 2021, moving over to being a international game publisher for smaller Japanese titles. Around Double Dealing Character's release, Zuna decided to focus a little bit more on gameplay over story, meaning I don't have as many cool things to talk about here in terms of our own history. Despite this, there is still some lore to be gleaned here. The character behind the incident this time around is Saija Kijin, an Imaku Jaku, which is a type of Oni. However, in the world of Toho, she's treated a bit differently than our counterparts. She has the power to turn over anything, with the name Seija referencing that, loosely translating to both good and evil as well as right and wrong. In Double Dealing Character, she acts as a catalyst for events, with the goal making it so the weak rule over the strong against Tokyo. Despite her methods, she's not evil, and despite her intentions, she's not good. Rather, she exists as a sort of devil's advocate for the entire world. In truth, even if she succeeded, her next step likely would have been just working to ensure that the strong ruled once more. Her existence is that of flipping the world upside down. She ends up convincing Shimiu Maru, an inchling who is said to be a descendant of Ishin Boshi or the One Sun Boy, that the misfortune that the inchlings had suffered was brought about by a yokai, and convinced to use a miracle mallet to her own ends. Ishinboshi is a character featured in Japanese stories who was nicknamed the Inch High Samurai, something I personally wouldn't want to be historically remembered for, but here we are. His adventures featured him voyaging across waters in a bull on a quest to become a warrior, wielding a sewing needle as a sword, and upon obtaining a magical mallet from an oni, used its powers to make him grow in size to win the love of the girl he admired. I'm wearing this like a Dick joke. Anyway, in the world of Toho, a descendant of Ishinboshi attempted to use the mallet in order to make a grand castle to rule over all of their inchlings. However, the mallet is a bit of a monkey's paw to the greedy. And as a result, the castle was made, except as the last of the power of the mallet was used, it sank into the ground and led to ruin for the inchlings, with them vowing to seal the mallet away forever. And eventually their remains ended up in Gensokyo. Seija finds the mallet, but can't use it because she's not an inchling and finds a further descendant still of Ishinbushi, who is unaware of their history and agrees to help, believing she's helping the little guys out. No pun intended. Once more, the mallet has a cost, and it causes assorted objects to go out of control. Some instruments becoming yokai, and the weapons of Reimu, Marissa, and Sakuya all behaving erratically, and developing a sort of corrupting influence over them should they choose to keep utilizing them, with the powers brought about by the mallet preying on each of their own weaknesses in different ways as shown by each character's A ending. Reimu goes soft and shows almost an unhealthy amount of care for her foe, Marissa goes mad with power and joins in helping to flip the pecking order in Gensokyo, and Sakuya goes on seemingly an unstoppable killing spree, believing her knife craves it, murdering all of the yokai on the lake outside of the Scarlet Devil Man as well as seemingly threatening Romelia, asking if she wants to test the cutting edge of her blade. In 2014, we'll get Danmaku and Manojaku, and possible spell card, the first official Toho game not to have Toho in the title. 
and it's the 14.3rd title in the series because this is easy to keep track of. It features, as the name would suggest, nearly impossible spell cards with the objective being simply survive, either by sheer force of will or by utilizing cheat items to make squeaking through just a little bit more easy. It was announced by Zen less than a month ahead of its launch at the end of a stream called Choto Summit, the drinking party of indie game developers, that madman. This game's also known to have an expansion, Danmaku Amanajaku Gold Rush. However, as of the time of recording, the expansion was never officially released in any capacity outside of the one event where it was playable. The story here follows immediately after Double Dealing Character, where you play a Seija. Due to her actions in the previous game, some characters have decided to take the kid gloves off and aim to exterminate her by any means necessary. In the end, she ends up losing all of her allies in her attempts to keep trying to overthrow the Order of Gensokyo. Something she doesn't seem to really care about, as it's actually impossible for an Imano Jaku to keep a friendship anyway. To Kanjiden Legacy of Lunatic Kingdom is a follow-up to Imperishable Night and was the 15th game in the series. It was released in 2015 and would also feature another new change for the series, providing two modes of play, Legacy and Point Device. Legacy simply being a traditional route with Toho games of having a life and continue system, where Point Device has a chapter system where if you die, you just go back instead to the beginning of a chapter. Sort of like a checkpoint system. With grazing now affecting how fast point items fall down the screen while you're actively grazing bullets, while also giving you graze points, which depending on mode of play is important either to keep help giving you extra lives or extra bomb fragments. In this game, you go back to the moon and beat the show of a bunch of rabbits. And also a clown. And also God. The main antagonist of Legacy of Lunatic Kingdom, Junko, is another historically inspired Toho antagonist based off Quan Chi, Chan Hu, or Pure Fox, written in the same characters that make Junko. She was a woman mentioned in Chinese literature, both historical and poetic, known for her beauty. After Ho Yi forced Quan Chi's husband, Ho Kui, into exile, Ho Yi took over the Jia dynasty, murdered her son, and forced her into marriage. Real charmer, this guy. She would then conspire with Ho Yi's minister, Han Cho, and ended up killing him. After this, she would marry Han Cho and have two more children with him. Ho Yi is also a name shared by a legendary archer who shot down nine sons in order to save the world from being engulfed in flames who was married to the Chinese moon goddess Chang Yi, an immortal who upon drinking an elixir of immortality floated away to the moon. And in the world of Toho is the true master of the moon rabbits, who continue to atone for drinking the immortality elixir to current day. The Ho Yi of Toho lore is a mix of these two figures, however with some small changes. There is no Ho Kui in Toho's versions of events, meaning that it's implied that Ho Yi just killed his own son. Junko's a being of pure fury, with an unending animosity towards the Lunarians as well as Chang'e. She's one of the most straightforward characters in Toho. She's not flashy, she's not misunderstood, she just really, really hates Chang'e and will kill anything that stops her from acting upon that hatred to an incredibly overdramatic extent. Her outfit and abilities call back to the pure fox name with her outfit having fox motifs and her ability to purify any object she interacts with by refining it to its purest form. The extra boss from this game, Hikadia Lapis Lazuli, the goddess of hell in Toho's world, also bears a grudge against Chang'e because Ho Yi shooting down the suns weakened the shadows of hell. What's also interesting is that Hikadia is likely also based off the Greek goddess Hectate, who is associated not just with the underworld, but the moon as well. Now you may have noticed this, but between Imperishable Night and Legacy of Lunatic Kingdom, the moon has a bit of a rabbit problem. Not that I'm complaining. I love rabbits. But there are major historical reasons for this, that Toho is among many to make reference to. You see, a lot of cultures throughout Eastern Asia, as well as in indigenous American folklore, the moon is heavily tied to the rabbit. Stemming from how if you look at the moon, one could interpret the dark markings as the form of a rabbit, with different cultures having different interpretations of what that rabbit is doing. In Chinese folklore, this rabbit is seen as a companion to Chang'e, with the Chinese and Vietnamese interpretations of the rabbit having it mix an elixir of immortality with a mortar and pestle, or sometimes mixing other medicines. Meanwhile, in Japanese and Korean cultures, the rabbit is seen as making rice cakes or mochi, a popular snack food made from glutinous rice that has been soaked, steamed, and then traditionally made with two people mixing the mochi by having one pound it with a large wooden mallet, while the other mixes it with their hands in a rhythm so as not to turn the other person's hands into dust in the process, with the mixture then being formed into shapes. In Toho, Chang'e rules over the moon rabbits, even when imprisoned, and has them pounding mochi eternally to atone for her sin of drinking an elixir of immortality as the elixir has made her become seen as impure by death for the absence of not being affected by it. Now for reference, there are two different types of rabbits. Moon rabbits like Raisin and uh, 
Racing, long story, there was another Racing in one of the manga who was owned by high-ranking officials in the Lunarian army. Don't worry, this is the only time I'm going to mention her. I just wanted to make fun of the fact that they're both named Racing. And there's also Earth Rabbits, who are led by Tiwi, who is based on the hair of Inaba, namely the Kojiki version, who is a trickster who convinced a bunch of sharks or alligators, depending on translation, to form a large bridge. And as the hair reached the end of the bridge, gloated about the deception, and it had its fur ripped off its body from the last link of the bridge. The hair would later be helped out by Onomuchi no Kami, the youngest of 80 brothers attempting to win the marriage of a princess, being the only one to offer a proper solution to help ease its pain after all the other brothers instructed it to wash in salt water and dry the water in the sun, with Onomuchi no Kami's advice instead being to bathe in fresh water and roll among the cattail pollen to dry off. Onomuchi no Kami would later ascend to become the Shinto god of nation-building agriculture, medicine, and protective magic known as Okananushi, a god that has since been conflated with the Buddhist god of fortune and wealth, Daikokuten. Within Toho, Tiwi knows Lord Daikokuten and reveres him, as well as learned medicine from him. However, she is unaware that he's been sealed in the Izumo Shrine by Lunarians. Grayson originally left the moon to flee, falsely believing war had begun after the lunar landing of 1969, and shows signs that she too lived in slavery under the Lunarians rather than willingly wanted to be there. She chooses to live a life with an Ayantai within the bamboo forest with Kaguya and Elrin to avoid being found and brought back. It's noted in the transcriptions from the Apollo 11 shuttle that they found Chong Yi and were looking for a rabbit girl. So this confirms it. The Lunar War was an actual thing. It's all a conspiracy, dude. They're hiding the rabbit girls from us, and I am not gonna fucking stand for it! While all this was going on, a lot was happening within the Toho community. As mentioned before, Japan had a major yearly convention for the Toho series, Raisatai, which is still going on to this day, and not to be outdone, North America sought to have a Toho con of its own. And so in 2014, the creatively named Tohokan was born. Tohokan ran in the summers of 2014 and 2015 in Anaheim, California. The team behind the events aimed not only to have the first Toho convention in North America, good job lads, but also to have it rapidly grow in scope and size year over year. The con itself, supposedly if you were a casual attendee from most accounts, was a lot of fun. Featuring guests brought over from Japan, vendors, panels that could appeal to anyone, even Naruto fans for some reason. And a lot of accounts say that it was a blast. If you're a guest and figure out your own hotel anyway. You see, the issue with all huge aspirations in the bane of almost every convention is money. Well, money and rampant unchecked degeneracy, but give me a minute. After a successful showing at Tohokan 2014, a modest yet very well received proof of concept, the team behind the con needed to follow it up. Tohokan 2015 would be bigger, it would be better, there would be bigger guests, more events. Tohokan would be the premier Toho event in North America, and they were willing to do anything to get there. That sadly includes grossly overspending. It costs a lot to ship over groups and artists over from Japan, and even more to room them as well as all the vendors during their stay. And that's before whatever fees they charge for their appearances as well. Tohokan 2015 wrapped up, but the money wasn't there. They fell short on what they needed to make and were up creek. So, in the face of extreme financial issues and burden as a result of ill planning, they did what anyone would do in this situation. Just sent the bills to the guests and vendors, with absolutely no notice or communication. In some cases, guests involved in making the convention the success it was were charged upwards of anywhere from a reported $300 to $1,500 for their rooms, and were not informed of this at all. These vendors and guests would only find out after they checked their bank accounts and saw the money had been taken out. This was an absolute disaster, and with no clear leadership to address this issue properly, would be the big thing that would ultimately kill Tohokan then and there. There have been rumors of a revival since, however, with other Toho events kind of taking its place, it's become more of a footnote in history as an event that was pretty cool for most people that experienced it, but something that's probably better left in the past. Look, it wasn't all bad, but it was clear by Tohokan 2015 that there were a lot of problems that just couldn't really be solved. In an effort to protect cosplayers, staff were reportedly stopping any and all photography, causing grief for any cosplayer at the event. And the issues didn't really just end with staff. Tohokan had a lot of external factors going on as well that were causing people to become wary of the event, ranging from scams and bootleg products being sold at vendor tables to reports of some attendees taking the plunge into the world of illegal drugs by the pool in the hotel, to reports of a couple of attendees being malicious towards the cosplayer sexually. It was a pretty sad thing to learn that this con seemed to almost be sabotaged in a lot of ways, both inside and out, between the mismanagement and the bad apples spoiling the pot. 
I think I'm just relieved I didn't stumble face first into a dash con situation. This is just an okay event that had a lot of problems and just isn't around anymore. Okay, enough of that, let's talk about orgies. Toakon is a legacy to a lot of people who attended the event. It was loved by many of the guests, but it had a reputation for something a little spicier going on. Dubbed the Tohokan Orgy. The Tohokan Orgy, which sounds like a hilarious meme, and it kind of is, is something that apparently happened, unless it didn't. Look, reports are fuzzy, and every hero has an origin story, every con has an orgy story somewhere in its history, and I can't exactly get into the explicit details on a YouTube video. I'm working on nine-year-old rumors here, and they range all over the place. But legend has it, there was a Tohokan Orgy. And it had some lasting ramifications on the event. Look, I'm not going to judge, just, uh... Always remember that you should have protection when participating in a battle of bullets for someone, or a pile of someone's. After all, all it takes is one shot and it's game over. I'm also unsure if this group is related, if there are just a lot of Tohokan orgies or what the hell was going on, once again limited information, and it's not like I was there to verify how many Tohokan orgies were going on in 2014. I was busy talking about more important things, like Vex. But there was a group for the Tohokan Orgy, and they are still active to this day, arranging meetups at assorted events. It truly is something amazing that the Tohokan 2014 Orgy group has gone on to massively outlive Tohokan. What isn't a rumor, however, is that supposedly one of the organizers commandeered a guest cosplayer's hotel room, removing the intended occupants from the list of people that could enter it, and used it for a party. Guest comes back, reasonably pissed off, and after the room gets cleared out, they get a half-assed apology leading to them packing their things, which were already in the room, by the way, and leaving the convention that night. An apology video was made that got posted to Facebook, but it's lost the time, and regardless, like, no apology is gonna make up for that kind of invasion of privacy. That's a mess, and the damage has already been done. Anyway, I'm pretty happy to say that new cons have come along to replace Toho-Con and have done a pretty bang-up job doing so. Toho Fest 2023 was a massive success and loved by those who attended. And I'm glad that even if Toho-Con was a bit of a mess, its spiritual successor has managed to carve itself a spot in the hearts of fans and has seemingly established itself as the Toho convention Toho-Con always wished it could be. Toho also started to appear out and about in other well-known series, in manga, TV, and games. Reiju would make a cameo in Craig of the Creek, as well as have a piece of armor in Path of Exile based off her outfit, with Path of Exile also having a reference to Moku in the form of the item Moku's Embrace, with the description, Fire makes the perfect blossom in the endless night. Suika Ibuki was used as a technical difficulties image on ESPN for some reason. The character Shanghai Alice in Hyper Dynasty Neptunia is based after Zun's company and is designed as a reference to Reimu. League of Legends is full of references, from Lux referencing Marissa to two items being Toho references in their own right. Yomu's Ghost Blade referencing Yomu's swords, and Riggle's Lantern being a reference to Riggle Nightbug. Chirno randomly appeared in an episode of My Strange Addiction. Ragnarok Online has headgear based off Toho characters. There's a Toho arcade machine in the Scott Pilgrim comic. World of Warcraft has a reference to Nazrin, she's Michu. There were two collaborations with the rhythm game Muse Dash, leading to Mercer and Reimu becoming playable characters, alongside a pile of fan remixes from throughout the series' history getting added as tracks, and there were also countless anime and manga references tossed in here and there. Some fighting games even have colored palettes as references to Toho. If you look hard enough, there's a little bit of Toho snuck in a lot of places you wouldn't really expect it. Undertale is another big example, with Toby Fox getting a lot of inspiration from Toho and with references peppered throughout the game, especially in the music. In 2023, this would end up coming full circle, with the announcement that Toby Fox and Zin would be collaborating on DLC for the rhythm game Toho Danmaku Kagura Fantasia Lost, showing off a preview of an arrangement featuring Toby Fox rearranging Yuan On Was Her and Zin rearranging Battle Against a True Hero, creating the mashup song Yuan On Was Hero. Sounds fucking sick. Almost as sick as hearing Toby Fox saying the word project like he's scolding a misbehaving child every time he mentions a series in Japanese interviews. Toho Project no Thundis. Toby Fox also has a Toho OC, Apple Girlington, who was created as a joke in response to people telling him all the time that his music sounded just like Toho. Toho 16 Hidden Star in four seasons once again would lower the difficulty compared to previous entries and came out in 2017. It's the first Toho game to officially make it on Steam. Yay! Hidden Star in four seasons has a system built around the seasons as its main gimmick, with each character having a season tied to them alongside a sub-season that the player can choose from. Reimu is Spring, Summer is Chirno, Autumn is Aya, and Winter is Marissa. As you defeat enemies, Grey's Bullets progress through boss fights, you build options, which you can release to use your sub-season ability which will convert orbs caught in it into green point items. This is changed in the extra stage to an EX season instead. This time around, the main antagonist Okina Matra is based off the Buddhist god of destiny and stars, outcast and performers Matra Jin. 
Her name being a reference to this, with Okina roughly translating to Hidden Hell Theater, and is homophonous to Okina or Old Man, the name of a mask normally used in Buddhist religious performances. Matra coming from Matra Jin, Matra Jin actually relating as well to the Japanese hero Hada no Kawakatsu, who was a trusted associate of Prince Shotoku. Matra Jin in our world would fall from grace as a deity due to a combination of things, but primarily it was a combination of rituals involving Matra Jin sometimes being sexual in nature, as well as Japan's efforts at the time to ensure that Shinto and Buddhism religions remain separate. Anyway, she can open doors on people's backs and it lets them gain powers based off the different seasons. Also, it made the fairies really fucking strong. With her ultimate goal being to be remembered and embed herself in the hearts of Gensokyo, which she does achieve through her actions. Soon it originally intended for Okina to be a commentary on people living with physical disabilities, having her appear in a wheelchair. With the plan being for the game to tell the story that people suffering from disabilities are the strongest of all. However, he felt the topic was a little bit too heavy for Toho and axed the idea. Although she does appear in some works in a wheelchair still, with Zun retconning it to be that she acts as a personification of disability itself, a real thing we have to accept in the world. 2018 would not have a mainline Toho game and instead we would get Hifu, Nightmare Diary, Violet Detector, an evolution of the shoot the bullet style of side game. Featuring Sumeriku Usami, a character from Urban Legend and Limbo, as a playable character after getting trapped in an unending nightmare, where characters are repeatedly attacking her. Using her psychic abilities like teleportation to avoid attacks as well as taking pictures like and shoot the bullet to increase her social media following. It's the 16.5th game in the series. Toho 17 Wily Beast and Weakest Creature will be the next main entry released in 2019 is supposed to be, in Zen's words, darker and a bit more aggressive than other entries in the series. Returning from 10 desires are spirits, in this case animal spirits, which each have their own benefits as well as build up a gauge to give you more resources. Now you might be asking yourself, which animal spirit is the best one? It's Otter. It's always Otter. Just use Otter and Marissa. Just, just do it. This bomb is fun. Just whatever you do. Don't let that Otter near your other video games. The main antagonist this time around, wouldn't you know it, also has historical ties. Keki Heniasushin is based off Heniasu, the Shinto god of soil, agriculture, and pottery who was born from the conflation of two gods, Hanya Sabiku no Kami and Hanya Sohime no Kami, who were born of the literal shit that came out of the corpse of Izanami no Mikoto after she died giving birth to the fire Kami Kagawasuchi. That's right, these are the sick details you've been waiting for. Keki's outfit is based on the burial mounds found in Fukuoka Prefecture in Japan, as well as the outfits worn by clergy women or mediums. The extra boss, Saki Kurakoma, has a really nice hat. She's also based on Kaino Kurakoma, the legendary horse of Prince Toku, who would fly through the skies and accompany him on his journey to spread Buddhism. Yachi Kicho and Yurumi Yushizaki are both based off Japanese mythical creatures, with Yachi being based off the Jidaio, a serpent who bears the body of a tortoise and the head and tail of a dragon, and Yurumi based off a cow oni or yokai who bears the head of a bull in the body of a spider, who would trick passers-by through getting them to hold onto a baby which would turn to stone in their hands, weighing them down before attacking. The story this time revolves around the beast spirits in their kingdom, with a power imbalance leading to spirits attempting to take over Gensokyo. After this, the 18th installment, Toho Koryudo, Unconnected Marketeers were released in 2021 featuring a gimmick around spell cards, with them appearing as collectibles and levels as well as being purchasable in between them to augment your character, with an encouraging replayability through unlocking new cards on each playthrough. Unconnected Marketeers also marks yet another big change for the series, as it's the first game to launch digitally first and not at Comic Cat due to the ongoing pandemic, although physical copies were available at Comic One BS Festival and included a special card if you bought it there. This would have an immediate follow-up, 2022's Ho 18.5 Bullet Philly Atachi no Yami Ichiba, 100th Black Market, which would use the same ability card system and would be released to help celebrate Comic Cat 100 as well as Toho's 25th anniversary. Zen would take a different approach to music here compared to other entries in the series, focusing more on the emotion of a scene rather than just a song for a character or level. Marissa went apeshit in this game and now her eyes are red for some reason. The antagonist this time around is Chimata Tenkyu, based on Ishigami, or the gods of marketplaces, barter, and trade, who were worshipped to protect festivals and marketplaces. Her design suggests that she is the god of special event marketplaces, potentially representing an old medieval Japanese custom where there would be special markets whenever there was a rainbow in the sky, with people of the time believing the gods would receive whatever was bought at one of these medieval markets. Tenkyu is written with the same characters as Heaven and Bo, however the same writing in Chinese makes Rainbow, Chimata meaning public in streets. Unconnected Marketeer's extra boss is also pretty interesting, Momoyo Himiyushi, who is likely based off the Umukade from the tale of Tawara Toda, 
a Japanese story dating back to the 14th century, who was known for eating dragons and was slain by a distant relative of Fujiwara no Moku, her name translating to insect royalty. Toho 17.5 Gyoku Ibu and Sunken Fossil World came out in 2021 as well, with it ending up releasing after unconnected marketeers due to delays. It's a side-scrolling shooter action game kind of thing. It's kind of hard to pin down a genre on this. It's a pretty unique beast. And it's what happens when Flint, Michigan happens against Tokyo, with all the water turning black and seemingly being corrupted by an oil that affects anything that comes in contact with it. Unlike the last entertainment I experienced involving evil oil, at least this one seems to have a complete and proper story. Toho 1, Magic the Gathering, Zero. Sunken Fossil World would also mark a big return for Flander as Scarlet, who hadn't really been a big thing for the series in like 19 years at that point, with her being the only character in the game to actually have a true ending to the final boss. There were a few rumors floating around at the time that due to health reasons, this would be Twilight Frontier's last work on the Toho series, but it seems like that's been since debunked. And now we look to the present. As of now, we are just coming off the release of Toho Jonin Unfinished Dream of All Living Ghosts, and it released on August 14th, 2023. And it's a return to the gameplay of the previous Phantasmagoria games. Sadly as it stands, I have to leave the current most recent game in the series on a slightly bittersweet note as it looks to be a weak entry in the series. Missing the long-standing features of having a score tally as well as removing the ability to save replays. I think that's a huge loss for a series like Toho where now it means that players have to be recording every attempt at the game instead of being able to go back to it after the fact when going for a 1cc. With that said, it isn't all negative. With its wide array of old and new characters as well as unique ways to build them for versus mode, as well as it looking like Zin's actually been working on his art some recently because it's improving a lot. Despite its shortcomings, All Living Ghosts still looks like an awesome experience for people looking to play against friends. Just uh, probably wait for someone to mod in some rollback netcode for this one if you're looking to go online. Spoilers inbound because this game just came out. I'll timestamp after them if you want to skip these. Three, two, one, go. This game acts as a follow-up story-wise to unconnected marketeers in 100th Black Market, with the markets leading to the land itself losing its ownership and being preyed upon by beast spirits. With many of its new characters being beasts that reside in Hell, all based off of mythical beasts in different ways. Cherry Tenkajin being a gluttonous chupacabra from North American lore combined with a Tenkajin, a blood-sucking will of the whiz from Japanese folklore. Enoko Mitsugashira is based off the Cerberus, a mythical three-headed dog that guards the gates of the underworld in Greek mythology. Baiten's son is hey, also known in Goku. Japanese as Sun Wukon, pronounced Son Goku, a character from a story titled Story to the West, a fictional work based off the historical journey of Quang Chang a 7th century Chinese monk who wished to obtain better translations of their Buddhist scriptures. In the story, Son Goku is a monkey born from a stone nourished by the five elements who wields incredible powers as well as a bow staff, who came to rebel against gods only to be sealed away by a Buddha, before later being released to help Tang Seng Zhang, story of the West version of Quang Zhang, in his quest to obtain Buddhist sutras or scriptures from India. Or at least this is what I would be saying. But each of these characters are actually subversions of these figures. The Chupacabra is a little gremlin who just wants some warm sip. The Cerberus is an old dog that was reborn from a magical jewel. And that's not even the real Goku. Likewise, the final boss of this game, Zanmu Joran, is an Oni and the one responsible for there being an old and new hell within Toho. However, she is an outright malicious in her actions. Actually being the person who solves the land ownership issue in the end. Nor is she related to any other Oni we know about at this point. With her being a human that absorbs spirits in order to become an Oni. An interesting twist for the series, featuring a cast of main villains who aren't actually trying to cause problems. Also, I think this eggplant is gay. I'm sure this won't be the last we see for the series. I look forward to seeing what's next for the games themselves. Marissa's a furry now for some reason. The rat's back. I'd hope Rumi will be playable. She could really use a W right now. Oh, poor Rumiya. And beyond that, Zen continued living the dream, making occasional appearances for interviews and fan events, but mostly sticking to working on Toho and drinking beer. Through it all, the memes would persist and evolve with the times and the games as they arrived. Momiji would a woo, everyone would a haiu, Elon Musk became a Toho that one time before everyone kind of hated him. And when day is dark, always remember happy day. And at last we hit it, the biggest Toho meme of them all. The meme that the other memes wished it could be. One that drives even the most curious onlooker and the equivalent of a crack fiend looking for their next fix with a dealer who's always looking to deliver should they have the cash. Fumo.
you've been watching the video up until now, you'll likely have seen a lot of footage of Fumo already. There are these cute little plushies of a bunch of the different Toho characters made by the company GIF, starting with Inu Sukuya, Sukuya with dog ears back in the late 2000s, before going on to far larger print runs. Fumo are simple, they're cute, and they carry with them a certain chaotic energy, it's a little bit hard to describe. Fumo observe the world, they take part in it, they cause chaos in it, they like cheeseburgers, they drive cars, they adventure, they like burgers. Fumo have almost in their own way managed to evolve past Toho, becoming their own thing with their own dedicated community who travel with their Fumos and chronicle the average life of one. Unlike a lot of other collectibles, fancy bootleg Fumo is just part of the experience, welcoming even the ugliest, shoddiest bootlegs with open arms. And even in some cases, as with Inu Sukuya, have worked with companies producing bootlegs to improve the quality of them, to ensure that even though the real deal Fumo can become quite unobtainable and expensive, there's a Fumo out there anyone can afford with dozens of characters to choose from. Hell, they're even making an official Zoon Fumo. At first, Fumo ran his pre-orders with limited quantities through sites like Ami Ami. Oh, the dark ages. Fumo would sell it in a second, sites would crash, people would be fighting with outdated websites just to get their Fumo in their carts, and god forbid it was before Ami Ami was shipping them to other countries, because back then you had to deal with figuring out how to import it yourself if you were outside of Japan. Fumo started going for hundreds on the secondary market, hell, some still do, and for some, the bootleg seemed like the only real option. Luckily, those days are behind us. With new Fumo runs being in batches as made-to-order pre-orders with multiple weeks to get in. It's because of that I have two official ones, and two bootlegs, and multiple pre-orders. I swear when I started this video I was getting one for filming. Here we are. And like, it's not just like there's only Fumo anymore. There's regular Fumo, there's small Fumo, there's puppet Fumo, there's Deca Fumo, which are huge. There's medium Fumo, which are just Fumo Fumo. There's whatever the hell this thing is Fumo. There's good bootleg Fumo, there's bad bootleg Fumo. There's bootleg non-Toho Fumo. There's official non-Toho Fumo. But if you're this far in the video, you're probably just more interested in the Toho ones anyway. There's tan Fumo, there's not Fumo. I can go on, these gremlins and plush form are everywhere. Fumo these days are to a point where they have their own games, their own music videos, their own subreddits. It's truly a beautiful thing to witness and be a part of. And it goes to show the enduring impact of the series, and a perfect place to kind of cap things off, I think. Another example of Toho transcending its roots, growing in a new way to an even broader audience, and once again introducing a lot of people to one of the most unique, beautiful series in any form of media. When I set out to make a video on Toho originally, I wanted to just go over how it became a huge deal in the West, how it became this fun little community of like-minded people who have a love and appreciation for one part of the series and its characters or another. But what I found instead was a wealth of interesting information, a story of triumph against all odds, and the growth of a silly little series that sold 80 copies leading to a huge series that after 25 years is going stronger than ever with more fan support than ever. It's so amazing to me that this series almost perpetuates its own growth. It's never forgotten its roots and thrives off the fact that because the fan works of the series spread so far and wide, there truly is a Toho experience for anyone. His story is interwoven in the lores and folk stories of so many different cultures and time periods, with characters that draw so much on history to amplify what in so many other series would be just another character. The series has grown to touch me in some way. At the very least, I'm a lot more of a meme lord thanks to this dumb shit. And this series has introduced me to so many incredible things. I'm smarter for having learned about aspects of what makes Toho. This series, its fans, its world, and all the things within it. It's incredible to me. And it's a series that will always inspire creativity in those that experience it. There's nothing like Toho. And no, this isn't just like a two hour video of copium on how I can't stop tuning. Stop looking at me like that. At the end of the day though, the thing that makes Toho so special beyond absolutely anything else is that Toho to each of us is what we make of it, and I think that's pretty incredible. There's so many aspects of this series someone can get into and enjoy or delve deeper into, and that's what I really hope this video helped to exemplify. Toho isn't something to be gatekept, but instead something to be celebrated in all of its forms. It's evolved so much past that table at Comic had all those years ago. It has interwoven itself into the history of the very world we live in. If you've made it this far in the video and you aren't already into the series in some way, I can't stress enough that you should find something amongst the mountains of works and projects Toho has to offer, and fall into a world unlike anything else out there. The year is 20XX. 
A much older man goes to his computer, I'm unsure if it still even works. The worn fans whir to life, the drives spin, the system springs into action. While it's clearly much older now, worn from the ravages of time, its parts louder, its components worn from years of use, on the screen is a time capsule of a simpler point in that man's life. The world has changed, but the files are just as he left them. He opens a game, a small study project he'd finished in 1995 and had been showing off at his university during 1996. It's called Toho Raiden, highly responsive to prayer. Inside, he feels a great nostalgia. Thank you.